Hello, and welcome to Military History Inside Out, brought to you by War Scholar. We talk about military history from ancient times to modern and everything in between. I'm Chris Alvarez, and thank you for listening. I'm speaking with Roger Morehouse, author of Poland 1939, The Outbreak of World War II, which will be on sale May 5th, uh, 2020, published by Basic Books. Thank you for speaking with me. My pleasure, Chris. So first, uh, tell me, how did you get into studying and writing on this subject? Um, I started writing or working really on Polish history a long time back when I, uh, my first degree, I was, uh, went to the School of Slavonic Studies in London, um, which was, you know, a school specifically studying sort of Central European history and politics and language and so on. Um, so that was very much my sort of, uh, my first interest was really in Central European history. And then some of my, when I started writing history myself, then I sort of defaulted into writing mainly mainly um, Third Reich history um, mm. because I speak German, so that was that was sort of an obvious direction to go in. But um, my last couple of books have sort of um, I've, I've gravitated more towards the, the the stuff that I originally was fascinated by, which is Central European history. So the previous book to this one. Uh, was the Devil's Alliance, which was also published by by Basic, mm-hmm. uh, came out I think in 2014, um, and that that was a study of the Nazi Soviet Pact, which is you know sort of combines those two um, fascinations of mine really. So Nazi Germany on the on the one hand, and then and then the effects of that that the Nazi Soviet Pact it plays out mainly in Central Europe. So uh, mm-hmm. um, that sort of married the two together. And this one, uh, Poland 1939, really. I suppose to a large extent grew out of that last book because this was the obvious gap in the literature because there's not very much on this uh, subject in English. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely a fascinating subject. I've started reading it. I'm just about, I guess, maybe 20 or 30 pages in. It's a very uh, smooth narrative. Um, thank you. Not dry. And uh, and fascinating. I'll tell you, so I'll, I'll ask you what you focused on in the book, but I do want to make the point that it's fascinating how Everyone talks about the power and and efficiency of the German military. And and at the start here, you can see that pretty solid Polish defenses, uh, defensive lines did a good job against German tanks and such. So so if you'd like to discuss that. Yeah, I mean, that was it it, it was one of my sort of intentions was to try and combat, I suppose, the, the mythological narratives that have risen up about around this subject. I mean, this is um. The subject of this, what what I broadly call the September campaign, right? So, so Poland's, it used to be known as Poland's defensive war, but I, I call it Poland's September campaign. Um, it's not really been talked about. It doesn't really sort of feature in the narrative. Obviously, the American market and the American mind is much more focused on World War Two between forty one and forty five. Obviously, because you know that's that's your direct involvement in World War Two, right? So. Mm. To to a certain extent, 1939 is is almost like a sort of a far off prelude to your involvement in World War Two. So it's never really been part of the American narrative, mm-hmm. except in Polish emigre circles. But even in the British narrative of the war, it's it's really it's really not very well known at all. And it's quite, if you think of it in those terms, it's rather bizarre because the September campaign is the is the reason that Britain goes to war, right? The, the, the German invasion of Poland in, on the 1st of September is the reason that Britain goes to war. Arguably, it's the reason that, you know, a central European squabble between Germany and Poland becomes a world war in the first place, because that's that's why Britain and France declare war on Germany. So uh, if you think of it in those terms, you think, well, it, we should know more about this. It should be sort of an essential part of the narrative. And it, uh, unfortunately, it really isn't. Mm-hmm. So in the in the in the lack of knowledge that we've had for a long long time, um, you're left with sort of these you know st- rather stereotypical, rather sort of mythological narratives, and particularly the German one. And the German one always said that you know the Germans were vastly superior. You know they're all in tanks and they're sort of fighting this enemy. The enemy that's all on horseback mm-hmm. uh, is very primitive. Now, this was the old propaganda narrative of, of 1939, 1940. And to a large extent, that stuck. And, and because people don't write about the September campaign, they don't discuss it, you know, the propaganda narrative has stuck. So to a large extent, what I wanted to try and do was to was to actually get back to, you know, telling a factual story about this, mm-hmm. a sensible story with 
you know, archival references and archival accounts and all that sort of thing to actually tell the story properly and to get away from all of that mythological stuff. Mm -hmm. If you try and, you know, if you set yourself that task, then, uh, you know, very quickly you see, as you, as you just described, Chris, you know, the, the opening couple of days, certainly of the campaign, the polls actually give a very good account of themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's very counter to this sort of conventional German narrative as was. Uh, which said that, you know, that they were pretty useless and they're all on horseback and they couldn't fight and all the rest of it, that, you know, the Germans were sort of naturally superior. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, there's a lot there to actually describe. There's a lot there to talk about, which is, which is why I wanted to write the book. Mm -hmm. So, so far I get the impression that the, um, sort of the, the, the stream of the narrative is on espionage and, um, military tactics and operations. Um, yeah. is that the thread you, you follow or does it, uh, expand or change as the book goes? Uh, on? It, it does, it, it does change. I think the opening, um, the opening section, there's much more of this sort of, um, the espionage aspect. So a lot of it is the Germans are actually trying to, uh, not only isolate Poland, um, but, but also to, you know, to undermine Poland with the use of sort of special agents and, and basically, I mean, what we'd now call terrorism, I suppose. So, you know, the Germans are sort of burning down buildings on the border and sort of pointing the finger at the, at the Poles and saying they did it. Um, there are, you know, bombs are set off within Germany by German, within Poland, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, by German agents. Um, so this is all in the run up to the outbreak of war itself. It's an, an effort to undermine Poland mm -hmm. and ultimately to try and portray Poland as being not only unstable but also an unworthy ally for the western powers so it's all part of a sort of diplomatic uh and and terroristic effort to isolate poland so you know that all of that that sort of um espionage aspect you mentioned comes in very early on it then kind of disappears mm -hmm. and then you're down to a military story which is one of german superiority we shouldn't forget that you know the germans are technologically uh numerically superior as well at the time, but it's also, you know, very spirited and I would say heroic defense by the Poles mm -hmm. uh, to stand up to that as best they could. Um, you know, they're dealing with you know, not only new methods of warfare in the sort of the opening, the opening use of blitzkrieg tactics and so on, but also, um, you know, the Germans use of air power was something that, you know, that the Poles really had no experience of and, and struggled to deal with. Mm -hmm. So they really are up against it. We can't deny that. But I think, you know, the take home from this is that actually they, they actually they fought rather well. I wonder. So the early German setbacks in the first few days, is it was it yeah. overconfidence? I mean, if they had been a little more deliberate, would they have avoided these problems or, you know, what, what could they have done? Um, that's a that's a good question. I think in some cases it probably is a degree of overconfidence that they thought they would just you know roll over the poles. And what's interesting is that wherever the poles actually had you know fortified positions to defend, then they could they could defend very very effectively. Uh, and if you know a, a German soldier sort of toe to toe with a Polish soldier at this time, there's really not much difference between them. The differences are mainly in. Uh, technology in numbers, of course, the, the Germans have many more uh, tanks of a decent standard than the Poles do. Poles do have tanks, incidentally. Um, so numbers, certainly, and in, and in technological advance. So it's those things that are, that are decisive. But the Poles are very good at uh, defending fixed positions, which they do in a number of positions, like, like at um, Wawa up in the north and other places where they actually had, uh, you know, bunker networks and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's a sort of an essential part of the story is actually to, to uh, you know, as I said, sort of show that the Poles were competent um, in fighting their corner, which they did. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also that this sort of the, the, the supplementary German narrative to this is that of the Blitzkrieg, that Blitzkrieg is a, you know, a, a, a irresistible, is, um, something that has that rolls over the poles and they can can do nothing to to resist and mm -hmm. and that's another one that I think needs to be you know put into a wider context. The Blitzkrieg is very much in the process of developing as a military doctrine in 1939. Mm -hmm. I think arguably Blitzkrieg is not really the sort of the complete finished article until 1941. So in 1939, certainly they are still. You know, to a certain extent, experimenting and finding their way with Blitzkrieg tactics. So in some instances, it works very well, and in other other instances, it doesn't. Mm 
mm-hmm. uh, and you can see that quite clearly in the Polish campaign. So there's a number of uh, sort of mythological aspects that I wanted to bring out. But as as the book goes forward, you know, the, uh, you you bring in I, I bring in a lot more uh, voices of you know ordinary civilians as well. There's a number of really good diarists that I use, a couple that I discovered in the archive. Mm-hmm. Uh, that I use as well. So it becomes, it's a much more rounded sort of human story of war, really, Mm -hmm. uh, as it goes on. I'm speaking with Roger Morehouse, author of Poland 1939. You can find more information on his work at rogermorehouse.com. If you like this podcast so far, please subscribe to it and rate it if you can. Please go to my website, warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com for links to news, videos, new books, and my social media links. If you're interested in other kinds of history, you can find the links to my other podcasts and associated book lists at historyrabbithole.com. That's rabbit as in the animal, historyrabbithole.com. Thank you for your support. And now back to the podcast. It seems that the uh, weather and, and geography of Poland also made, uh, also created some problems for the yeah. Blitzkrieg method. Yeah. yeah, it's true. Poland is, as I said, it's up against it sort of technologically, numerically, uh, and also geographically. I mean, if you look at, I mean, obviously, the, I don't know if your uh, listeners are going to be familiar with the modern map of Poland mm. and where it sits in Europe, but um, that's actually rather different from the interwar map of Poland, which was sort of surrounded essentially you know at least on three sides by by germany you had this sort of you know this um outcrop of germany in east prussia which is now effectively northern uh northern poland and uh and the kaliningrad area of russia so P- poland back then is is you know, already in the in the sort of jaws of a german pincer even before a shot was fired in 1939 <laughs> Uh, and then, of course, to the east, you've got the Soviet Union, which was also a hostile power for, as far as Poland was concerned. Mm-hmm. You remember that uh, the Nazi Soviet pact that I mentioned meant that that uh, Germany and the Soviet Union were effectively colluding uh, against Poland in 1939. So they mm-hmm. weren't yet the enemies that they became in 1941. Uh, so Poland's geographical situation is pretty catastrophic already mm-hmm. uh, before a shot is even fired in 1939. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as you said, it, you know, add into that the weather plays a part as well, because the the, the Polish um, sort of tactical plan was to you know fight on the frontiers certainly to actually make sure that the battle is joined, mm-hmm. but then once battle had been joined to actually withdraw as quickly as they could because they knew they couldn't necessarily stand toe to toe against the Germans, mm-hmm. withdraw as quickly as they could to what they hoped would be more defensible lines. Now, those that know German, uh, Poland's geography know that it's pretty flat, right? Mm. Uh, so those defensible lines were basically the big rivers, the Vistula, the Narev, the Bug, uh, the rivers that flow through the heart of Poland. Mm-hmm. So that was the plan, was to essentially to withdraw to those defensible lines. But... The summer of 1939 was a very dry one. So uh, those rivers were running at something like, you know, uh, a 40% drop in uh, the volume of water that was running through them. So they, they couldn't even uh, defend those lines, even if they were even if they were able to militarily. Those lines simply weren't there. So they, they really, you know, conspired against in every sphere, not only military, but also, you know, in terms of the weather and geography and everything else. It's a very difficult situation. Mm-hmm. I also found it interesting, um, the bit about Guderian reminiscing about his ancestra- ancestral lands when he uh, yeah. went into Poland with his tanks. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's a, it's an angle that I suppose we forget, but, uh, you know, that area that, that he was talking about, which was once West Prussia, you know, this was territory that Poland had taken when it was reformed in 1918. You bear in mind that, you know, Poland up until 1918 was essentially not on the map. Um, Poland had been partitioned by Prussia, Russia and and uh, Austria-Hungary or Austria uh, going way back to the 18th century. There were three partitions of Poland and Poland disappeared from the map in 1795 uh, uh, and, uh, and only re-emerges after the collapse of those three powers in 1918 at the end of the First World War. Mm-hmm. So, yes, you know, someone like Guderian who advances, you know, westward, uh, sorry, eastward out of Pomerania and into the what, what is the Polish corridor, uh, actually makes a detour to his own uh, an, his own ancestral home, uh, which is quite a, a sort of remarkable little vignette, and it shows you that this is this is sort of contested land mm-hmm. in 1939, and that's that's 
one of the reasons for this sort of um, rather calamitous bad relationship between Germany and Poland in the interwar years is because you know Germany basically coveted that you know those those territories back again. It wanted those territories back. It wanted to expand into Poland anyway. Mm. Uh, certainly, the, uh, under the Third Reich from 1933, you've got this idea of Lebensraum wanting to you know create essentially a uh, uh, an internal Eastern European empire, and that's mainly at Poland's expense. So it's, this is still, you know, very contested territory in 1939. So um, you mentioned, I think, in some of the blurbs that uh, Germany used um, indiscriminate air, uh, air bombing, uh, killing of civilians, um, other yeah. tactics. Uh, and yeah. I'm curious to compare that against what they were had been doing in the Spanish Civil War. I know that's outside of the scope of the book a little, but... Yeah. I'd like if you yeah. could compare those. Yeah, it's well, it, the, the, the more useful comparison I would suggest is with the French campaign in 1913, in 1940, mm -hmm. uh, in the West, uh, which is a comparison I make in the book. I mean, you, you can do a similar job with Spain. But what, what's interesting here is that um, I think in our Western narrative, and particularly the British narrative, we kind of assume, I think, that the, the barbarism. In World War Two, you know the, the sort of rate of of uh, you know killing of innocents, killing of civilians, killing of POWs, and so on. Not least the Holocaust, of course, that kicks in later on. But all of that sort of accelerates. It develops as the war goes on. It sort of de develops a dynamic of its own. And the the assumption from that is that perhaps the opening phase of the war was was maybe you know vaguely chivalrous. But if you look at the Polish campaign in detail, as I have, you realise that's com a completely wrong assumption. Mm. The French campaign of 1940, so the the, adv the German advance westwards through the Low Countries uh, and into France, where they're of course met by the French and British armies in a six-week campaign. It, during that campaign, um, there are actually comparatively few massacres, mainly of POWs, mainly actually of French colonial troops. Uh, captured by the SS. Mm -hmm. There are only really, I think, three main massacres, either of POWs or civilians, which are, you know, Paradis, Wormhout, and another one at Vint in Belgium. And those, I mean, that's bad enough, right? I mean, if you're, if you're a, a you know, captured POW or if you're a civilian, that's bad enough to be on the receiving end of one of those. Mm -hmm. But if you compare that with the events of the Polish campaign, you can see there's a massive disparity because you know, in the French campaign, you've got maybe about 20 in total in terms of massacres. Bad enough, as I say. Mm -hmm. In the Polish campaign, you've got some, you know, upwards of 600 massacres in a similar time frame, so a time frame of about five weeks. So that shows you that there's something fundamentally different going on in the Polish campaign. Mm. And given that all other aspects I think are probably the same and probably comparable. So these are still, in many cases, they're still quite green troops that then they haven't necessarily been, you know, battle tested. They can still be quite twitchy. They can still be quite trigger happy. Mm -hmm. um, Blitzkrieg itself is still, a, you know, as I said, is a, is a technology or a, a military doctrine that's in the process of developing. So you can't really, you know, uh, uh, you know, there's no big difference there. Uh, the main difference I would suggest, and this is what I suggest in the book, is is that uh, German ideology, Nazi ideology of the time, viewed the British and the French as fellow Europeans, as fellow colonial powers, as fellow great powers. Uh, they viewed them fundamentally with respect. Um, you couldn't say the same thing about how the Nazis viewed the Poles. Hmm. So the Nazis viewed the Poles as being fundamentally racially inferior. And I think that is the thing that explains why uh, there is such a high rate of atrocities uh, in that Polish campaign in 1939. It's, it comes down to Nazi racism. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, did you come across incidents where um, German ethnic Germans living in Poland or, or people who had mm -hmm. German ancestry, once the Germans came in, was there much of turning on their neighbor like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm mad at you for yeah. such and such and, and just reprise all and... and you know, revenge. Yes, there's, but there's a lot of that. I mean, the, the Nazis were very good at motivating um, ethnic Germans in Eastern Europe to, to, to act as a sort of a, a cat's paw uh, against their um, uh, against sort of local authorities. So, for example, in Czechoslovakia in, you know, 37, 38, in the run-up to the Munich crisis of, of September 38, um, Berlin was very good at... Um, you know, using ethnic Germans in the Sudetenland, which was then, you know, German-occupied area of, uh, 
a German inhabited rather area of Czechoslovakia. They were very good at using those populations to destabilize Czechoslovakia, to destabilize the government in Prague. So this was something that, that uh, the Berlin government was already pretty good at, uh, even before 1939. And they do the same thing in Poland because Poland has, you know, a large German minority of population of about half a million in 1939 and concentrated very much around those sort of border areas as well. So they do use them as a sort of, you know, almost as a militia often. So there are a couple of examples where um, they try to ambush Polish troops, for example. I mean, there's a there's a, a famous, almost a civil war, actually, in a, in a place called Budgosch, up in the in the Polish corridor up in the north, mm-hmm. uh, what used to be known in German as, as Bromberg, which is known to history as Bloody Sunday. And the original Bloody Sunday was actually when Polish troops turned on uh, some of these German ethnic ethnic German militias that lived in in Bromberg in Budgosch, mm. um, and they turned on them because they had been sort of ambushed by these by these uh, ethnic Germans. Uh, and there is a sort of a, a pretty rough and ready reckoning with those uh, ethnic German populations. A lot of them are taken out and shot, mm-hmm. and a good couple of hundred of, uh, of you know, German populations are are killed in that way. And then, of course, when the when the German regular forces come into into uh, Budgosch in a couple of days later, then they avenge themselves in a spectacular manner against the Poles. So they then institute a slaughter of of uh, Polish civilians and Polish combatants and scouts and all sorts of people in revenge for that so you've got almost sort of you know effectively civil war situation in many places w- within poland that are german uh, you know inhabited by germans like that so that's certainly a big part of the story that, that uh, again i think has been either not talked about before properly or has been misunderstood but it's an important part of the narrative yes among the germans who are the principal architects of these sophisticated propaganda um, operations, and did they have any help from Germans living in Poland at the time? The German sort of propaganda propaganda is a, is a crucial part of what the Third Reich is doing and how it presents itself, obviously, um, and it's very adept at it. You know, under under Joseph Goebbels as the Minister of Propaganda, you know, he is um, really a genius at this sort of thing, and he's very skilled at it by 1939. He's been doing it. He's been propaganda ministry since ni- uh, minister since 19- 1933. So he's very good at what he's doing. It's it's generally very subtle. It's it's kind of very nuanced. It's not the blunt weapon that we might imagine, uh, you know, totalitarian propaganda to be. It's actually very subtle and nuanced, uh, uh, multi-layered thing. Um, so they really don't need too much in the way of lessons from anyone else as to how propaganda should be done. And, the, and this, you know, the creation of this uh, propaganda narrative surrounding 1939 is, is really quite cleverly done. It's used, um, it's, uh, crucial to this actually is the, is the story of cavalry against tanks, this idea that the Poles sort of foolishly sent their cavalry to, to, uh, to meet uh, German tanks in 1939. Which is one that, you know, it, it, if anyone out there sort of thinks they know anything about the, the Polish campaign of 1939, that's probably the story that they have. You know, that the Poles, you know, you know charged German tanks on horseback, which is actually nonsense. Uh, anyone, if you, you just think about it for five minutes, it's nonsense. Mm-hmm. The Poles are not, are fundamentally not that stupid uh, to send cavalry against tanks. There are a couple of instances, and this is why I wanted to, examine this story at more depth and see where it where it came from effectively and it's quite an interesting story there you know there are a number of examples where polish cavalry are engaged by german tanks but it's the other way around mm-hmm. so they they do you know generally polish cavalry is the is the you know the the elite of the polish army at this time mm-hmm. and they generally fight very well there's a couple of instances Battle of Mokra in 1930, in uh, you know first days of September 39, they they fight very effectively against the German Fourth Panzer Army down near Silesia. They generally fight dismounted. Um, they use their horses for mobility only, so they fight dismounted. They have artillery pieces, they have anti-tank rifles, and so on, and they are very much the elite of the Polish army. So the idea of them sort of spurring their horses and pulling their sabers out and, and charging at tanks, shouting hurrah, is, is rather nonsensical. That's not how it worked. Mm-hmm. That said, there are a couple of instances where they do do a traditional cavalry charge, but against infantry, mm-hmm. against German infantry. And in that situation, 
again, a cavalry charge can be massively uh, effective. So, you know, again, tremendously effective can instill terror in infantry forces to be charged by uh, by, by uh, cavalry on horseback. Um, so they do do that. And then there's a couple of instances where they're actually that that they do that effectively against infantry, and then they're countercharged or counterattacked by armor, you know, with with predictable results. So one of these events is during the you know the main battle in a sense it's more of a campaign than anything but the main battle of the campaign is is on the it's called the battle of the bzura mm -hmm. which lasts itself for about 10 days it's about 10 day engagement and during that time um what there was a an italian war journalist by the name of indro montanelli and he was uh, effectively embedded with german forces uh, and he was sort of taken to the battlefield on the aftermath of one of these engagements on the bzura uh, and shown the uh, you know the battlefield with the you know the scattered bodies of men and horses and everything else, mm -hmm. um, and he wrote a piece for the Corriere della Sera uh, in Italy, which was then headlined when it was published in in a couple of days later, uh, was headlined with the with the the line cavalry against tanks, and this is where I think uh, Goebbels got this got his uh, propaganda message from you know he he, he to him he had independent confirmation that these these mm -hmm. foolish poles were sort of sending their cavalry against german armor mm -hmm. um and and that's where the sort of story then balloons up is reported in the uh in the german press um you know citing that italian article and that becomes the dominant narrative of the war mm -hmm. um and it's a uh, again it's a it's a triumph of german propaganda and the fact that we're still talking about that propaganda narrative 80 years on mm -hmm. uh, is proof of that. You know, this is, this is you know, re quite a remarkable operation that that narrative has stuck for so long. Absolutely remarkable. And I compare that to an incident you write in the book about of, of what seems to be a very foolish German move, which is pushing dozens of tanks into this confined area surrounded on three sides, and they end up in complete confusion and shooting at each other and, and, cra yeah, and yeah. running into each other. And that's, yeah. you know, you could almost say, you know, there's the Germans looking as foolish with their modern uh, weaponry. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's it, exactly. And, I, and in a sense, that's the sort of nuance that I wanted to bring across is that, you know, where we think about this campaign at all, we think about it in completely two dimensional terms. It's black and white. Is one side being technologically superior and rolling over the other, and the other one being, you know, rather useless and trying to trying to fight on horseback against armor, and the the reality is much much more complex than that. And that, and Mokra is a very good example, um, because they, you know, the poles are outnumbered, are outgunned, um, uh, and they still fight a very very uh, respectable and bitter. Uh, rearguard action. Uh, they do retreat at the end of the day, of course, but they hold the, the you know, the, the uh, Polish uh, German po Panzer Army for the whole day, which is a remarkable feat. And I, I just wanted to bring across that that nuance, that that the, that complexity to the narrative. So I hope I've done that. Um, let's jump ahead to when the uh, the Soviets entered the war. Were the were the Poles um, were they prepared, or did they even anticipate an invasion from the east? like that yeah yeah i mean this is another really key aspect that i wanted to bring out is um you know as i said we don't know much about all of this campaign i think in the western narrative mm -hmm. but where we know anything about it we maybe know something about the german invasion and the and the soviet invasion of poland uh is has really sort of slipped through the cracks of history and that's what that's another aspect that i really wanted to bring out um, you know, much more forcefully than it has than has uh, has done before, and of course it's a it's a part of the story that you know the modern Russia is is still trying to deny. So the official uh, Russian narrative of World War II still tells us that you know they, the Red Army didn't invade Poland in 1939. That this was some sort of humanitarian uh, intervention to to sort of liberate local populations from the collapsing Polish state, which is nonsense. Um, so I really wanted to, you know, tell that story as, as, as well and as effectively as possible. But to go back to your question, Chris, um, the Polish forces in the east of Poland are really not prepared for, you know, the, the sort of outright mass invasion that they face from the Red Army. The Red Army had uh, something like half a million troops, um, 5,000 tanks, 2,000 aircraft, ranged right right along that long frontier of eastern poland 
Uh, and in response, the Poles had essentially uh, border policemen. They had what was, you know, the Border Protection Corps, the KOP, which was, uh, you know, completely lacking in any air cover, completely lacking in artillery, complete, completely lacking in armour, uh, essentially border policemen. By the time the Soviets invade, which is the 17th of September 1939, the, you know, all sort of Polish forces worth their salt are fighting against the Germans in the West. Um, so, you know, anyone that's, any military forces that were stationed in the in the East have more or less been withdrawn. So you've basically got half a million men of the Red Army with 5,000 tanks against police, uh, you know, border policemen. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a very unequal fight. Again, the Poles actually put up a you know remarkably solid resistance in many places, particularly where there are sort of bunkers and defences to uh, to be fought for, and also urban fighting in you know places like Grodno and Vilno uh, and Lwów as well down in the south. So there's a number of you know quite important engagements in that story, uh, but it's a very it is a very one sided fight. It must be must be granted. Um, but so it's an important part of you know of the whole of the narrative. You can't talk about September thirty nine and just talk about the German invasion because there are two invasions of Poland in nineteen thirty nine: the Germans to the west and the Soviets to the east. So we have to bear that in mind at all times that there are two totalitarian invaders in nineteen thirty nine. I'm speaking with Roger Morehouse, author of Poland nineteen thirty nine. You can find more information on his work at rogermorehouse dot com. If you like this podcast so far, please subscribe to it and rate it if you can. Please go to my website, warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com for links to news, videos, new books, and my social media links. If you're interested in other kinds of history, you can find the links to my other podcasts and associated book lists at historyrabbithole.com. That's rabbit as in the animal, historyrabbithole.com. Thank you for your support. And now back to the podcast. Did the Soviets, uh, so two things, did the Soviets engage in any kind of similar propaganda operation? And were there any records of atrocities um, from the Soviets that that you saw with the German army? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, certainly the the propaganda operation is, I mean, it's fascinating in the light of, you know, how Russia is behaving now, for example, behaved in in 2014 with the... um, you know, the invasion of eastern Ukraine um, ran along very similar lines, actually, in a, in a strange way. This sort of denial that they were invading, first of all, uh, and then this deliberate sort of disinformation. I mean, the Russian word desinformatia, uh, disinformation, I sp- sort of spreading not only one counter narrative, but many counter narratives, many, many stories to try and confuse people so that nobody knows what to do, nobody knows how to react. So, you know, very often the, the official story with with Russian forces or Soviet forces going into Eastern Poland, uh, the official story that was given was, um, you know, we're coming to help you against the Germans, to which the Poles kind of go, well, wonderful, you know, thank you very much. And then by the time they realise what's going on, they've been captured and disarmed. And the reality, of course, is that the Poles, that the Red Army is acting in collusion with the Germans rather than against them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this use of sort of, you know, these these uh, disinformation narratives was a, was very, very effectively done uh, by the Red Army in 1939. You know, there are a couple of examples of Polish garrisons in East, in Eastern Poland that are sort of waiting for the Red Army to arrive and welcome them, uh, you know, with a guard of honour and then realise that, you know, before they realise what's going on, they've been disarmed and are prisoners. You know, it's, it's, it's as almost farcical as that. Um, so yeah, the, the Soviets are very good at using propaganda and using disinformation, uh, to their advantage in 1939. Now, the second question about about uh, atrocities, Chris. Absolutely. I mean, the way I've the way I've sort of told this when I've been uh, 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 promoting the book here in the UK and elsewhere is that just as you have the Germans effectively carrying out race war in the West, as I said, the atrocities are, I would argue, are motivated uh, as much as anything by racial prejudice. Uh, in Eastern Poland, the Soviets are effectively carrying out class war because they bring communism with them. You know, the, the Red Army is not coming in as a purely military power. It's coming in as a, as a colonizing power, as a revolutionary power. Mm-hmm. It's bringing communism with it. Uh, and that means that society in the aftermath of that Red Army advance has to be turned on its head. So, you know, landowners, merchants, anyone, you know, the local uh, nobility, the priests, the, the, the lawyers, you know, the, the professors, um, 
all the local administration, the policemen, it, all of those sort of members of society are basically have to be locked up. There's a, a sort of a, a ethnic cleansing in the West and there's a, a, a class cleansing in the East. Mm. So there, there's a huge amount of you know, persecution of ordinary Poles in the aftermath of that invasion. Uh, and even during the Soviet invasion itself, there's a very deliberate targeting of the Polish officer corps. Uh, so there are a huge number of atrocities as well, where the officer corps very often are simply taken out and shot uh, because they represent everything that the Soviet Union kind of despises. Right? Many, many, they're very often from noble stock, so nobility. Mm -hmm. They're very often very, uh, uh, you know, uh, very faithful Catholics. Also, a reason to for, for Moscow to despise them. And of course, Polish nationalists. So uh, they're a class, en a class enemy, and uh, 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 as well as a sort of a national one. So very often, officer corps are taken out and dealt with in a very uh, brutal manner in 1939. So yes, there are. It's a, it's on a lesser scale than what's going on in the West with the Germans, but uh, it's nonetheless rather similar. I think, if I recall correctly, you uh, had a stat in the book that said um, one in five Poles died during World War Two. Is that did I get that right? Yes, yes, that, absolutely. That's a, yeah, I mean, that, I mean, the, the death toll, the Polish death toll in World War Two is is uh, eye watering. Um, so one in five of the population in 1939, effectively, you know, is killed during World War Two, which is remarkable. I mean, the, the the death toll is up, uh, you know, up above five million in total. So in terms of per capita death toll, um, you know, there's there's is the, the highest of World War Two, you know, measured per capita. Mm. So. Um, this is something I think we forget. You know, I think we we have a certainly in Britain. I don't know how how nuanced um, in a discussion of of World War Two is in in the US, but certainly in the UK, we you know our discussion of World War Two is really rather parochial. We kind of concentrate on all the aspects of the narrative that involve us. Uh, we sort of put ourselves front center in the story and think you know we were very heroic and we did this that and the other and weren't we great? Uh, we were on the side of the angels. Um, and I think we forget that, you know, certainly a nation like Poland suffered, a, you know, hugely more than we did, you know, not least in terms of figures, but in terms of this, you know, occupation throughout the war, uh, occupation also by the Soviets, you know, two different totalitarian systems for nearly two years. You know, the, the suffering of the Polish people is really rather phenomenal. It's rather mind boggling uh, when, you, when you think about it. Yeah. Now, let me turn... Uh ask you about the resources you used for your research. Uh, what did you rely yeah. on uh, to write this book? Um, I wanted to, you know, very obviously and very specifically target um, Polish archival resources. Mm -hmm. um, and for the reason that, you know, when talking about the Polish campaign, I mean, as, I, as I said at the beginning, this hasn't been talked about really enough at all. I think there's very few sort of really thoroughgoing studies of this campaign anyway. But those partial studies that there have been and those mentions that it gets in the sort of the grand, you know, the single volume grand narratives of World War Two, things like, you know, British authors like Anthony Beaver and, uh, and uh, Andrew Roberts and so on. Mm -hmm. um, the Polish campaign generally gets, you know, fairly short shrift. It might get 10 pages or 15 pages. And most of those pages are devoted to the agonies of Western politicians at the prospects of going going to war again. They're not actually talking about the Poles at all. So if we're lucky, you might get a few German sources, people like Guderian, who you mentioned, who wrote a, you know, wrote a very good memoir of this period. Um, so you might get a few German sources thrown in, but you really get nothing from the Polish side at all. So it always frustrated me that the more you look into this, the more you realise that, you know, the Poles who are the victims in all of this, are just kind of nameless, faceless, voiceless uh, individuals and really not given a fair crack of the whip. So what I wanted to do with the book was to was to really root out Polish sources, many of which had never really been looked at before, to, to flesh out that side of things, to give the Polish voice to, to their own suffering in 1939. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a number of you know really good archival uh, collections. Uh, one of the best are, uh, the, that we used was um, what was called Karta, K-A-R-T-A, Karta Archive in Warsaw, which was brilliant. Um, and the, the holdings of the um, Sikorsky Institute in, uh, in London as well, very, very useful, which is you know, effectively the archive of the Polish government in exile. Uh, and the Polish government in exile actually did a did an internal study uh, where they asked um, veterans from that campaign in 1940-41 uh, 
to actually write their reminiscences and, and ask them, you know, what went wrong and how did how did you experience the campaign of 39? So there's a lot of really good material from the Polish side, which, as I said, hasn't really been looked at, uh, certainly not for a sort of a popular history like mine before. So that, that was a real uh, uh, sort of headline intention, and I, I, I hope I've uh, carried it out. I imagine uh, as far as Soviet records, you might have had access back in the early 90s and yeah. you've been writing then but i uh, i yeah. i guess now it's you don't have much access no and i'm, I'm a, a little bit sort of persona non grata in in russia because i've written about the nazi soviet pact as well so i certainly couldn't go there myself hmm. um i did you know there's a we do benefit you're right that in in principle you're right that um soviet sources are, or access to soviet sources is rather restricted nowadays particularly to to western researchers um, but there is a couple of you know, positives here, one of which is that there's quite a lot of material and even relatively sensitive material was, was actually published in the 1990s in that sort of brief window of uh, you know, comparative openness uh, in Russia. Mm-hmm. So there are, some, there are some published collections. And then secondarily, um, there are you know, a number of, it sounds a bit counterintuitive, but there are a couple of really quite good studies that have come out of Russia um, which look at the sort of early phase of the of Red Army uh, involvement in 1939. Um, so there's quite, there's quite a, a relatively good amount of material. And also, I think more importantly, there's a lot of material in Polish as well, which looks at the Soviet invasion from the Polish perspective. So there was enough material there to sort of piece that together. Mm-hmm. Even if it's something that perhaps uh, you know the, the the current gentleman in the Kremlin uh, is a story that they don't necessarily want to be told. Mm-hmm. Did you get a chance to visit uh, many of the the battle sites or areas you talk about in the book? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's something I, I think is is very important. Um, I think very often nowadays, you know, with uh, all of the resources that you can find online and you can even, you know, with Google Earth and the rest of it, you can drop yourself in the street and see what a building looks like and all the rest of it, which is remarkable. I mean, you know, when I started writing and researching, you know, 30 years ago, not, none of that was possible. Um, so you could potentially write a book like this just from from the safety of your own office and never leave it. Um, but that's not how I want to do things. So I always, I think the sense of place is actually really, really important in terms of giving you, I don't know, something like a, almost a sixth sense about a feel for, for a place to actually describe, if you're going to describe it effectively, I think you really need to go there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did, I traveled quite widely over the last couple of years, uh, three years now since I was writing this book. Um, I have a, a visiting lectureship in Poland. So I'm there sort of uh, for three sessions every year uh, to teach. And then it was very easy for me to sort of hire a car and, uh, and disappear off and go somewhere and, uh, you know, meet with an academic or go to an archive or go to a battlefield. Uh, and uh, absolutely. So I traveled around, you know, Westerplatter up in the north, which is one of the, you know, most heroic stories of Polish defense uh, in 1939 and all the way down to Wiengerska Gorka in the south, which is in the far south as well, mm-hmm. uh, which was another, you know, a scene of a, a defense of a bunker network. So, yeah, absolutely. I, I traveled far and wide across across Poland in researching this book. And I think it's a, I think it's a crucial part of the of the process of researching is to actually go and do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What part of the research uh, was most enjoyable? I did. I did enjoy that a lot. That aspect I really enjoyed. I do like going to those places and like going to archives and actually, you know, doing the sort of nitty gritty of research. I, I, I find I have a great thrill in doing that. Um, and then actually, the, the the sort of crowning thing for me actually is the writing. I really enjoy writing. Um, so as long as you know the material stands up and you've got enough of it and it's good enough, then sort of piecing that together into a coherent uh readable narrative is uh, i find you know a great pleasure in doing that so actually of the whole process i I think probably writing itself is the most pleasurable but uh i certainly enjoyed the the research as well Mm -hmm. what did you find uh, for this particular book what did you find that most surprised you i was fairly well versed with with all of this i mean it's not a it's not a history that was um new to me when i began and of course you always have to do you know, quite extensive treatments of the subject to, you know, to get the book contracted by publishers and so on. So mm-hmm. that always involves quite a lot of research and actually knowing your subject fairly well. Mm-hmm. So I certainly wasn't coming to it 
you know, completely fresh. Um, but that said, the thing that I think surprised me was the degree of, of the atrocities, as I mentioned, the extent to which Poland is really put to the sword by the two invading powers, not only the Germans to the West, but the Soviets to the East. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's an aspect that I think, I think actually a lot of readers will probably be shocked by as well, because it's, it's not something that they will be familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, we're familiar with it later in the war when we get into the sort of, you know, the narrative of the Holocaust and, you know, with the German invasion of the Soviet Union. We're, we're familiar with the brutality, the, the brutality that's meted out to ordinary civilians in the Soviet Union after 41. Mm -hmm. But I think we'd, we'd be surprised to see it uh, in 1939 and we'd be surprised to see it from the Soviet side as well. And that, would, that was one surprise to me. The sheer scale of it was one surprise to me. Mm -hmm. So I know there are always a lot of uh, gaps in history, but was there a particular question that you had a lot of difficulty trying to uh, resolve or come to a conclusion on, or maybe is still very much open for you that you want to solve? Not on, not with this subject. I think I think that you know I'm I'm quite pleased uh, with this book that I, I feel like I've done you know a good enough expose of it. I think it's I think the book stands up very well. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't I don't feel like there's any sort of you know massive gaps left on the, on that type of subject certainly. Mm -hmm. On a wider aspect, I mean there's always there's always going to be gaps in terms of I think this aspect of the East and the Western War, which I think I mentioned earlier on, you know the Eastern War is a much more brutal war. It's, much, it's an, a, a war in which there's really no quarter given or expected um, to local civilian populations, mainly because the Nazis viewed most of them as being subhuman. Mm. Um, so I think that's an aspect that needs to sort of penetrate the Western narrative a lot more effectively. We need to understand in, in Britain and elsewhere um, the scale of the of the you know atrocities carried out, the scale of the of the you know the racial conflict, uh, which as I said before is absolutely mind-boggling in many instances, and, and it's very easy for us. Brits, particularly Americans as well, to kind of almost luxuriate in what we achieved. You know, we in Britain, we talk about the Dam Busters Raid or we talk about, uh, you know, D-Day or we talk about the uh, the Battle of Britain. And we kind of and we and we preen ourselves and we say, didn't we do well? Um, and yes, we did. But, you know, it, 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 we have to understand the, the, the thoroughly brutal uh, experience of, of other other people's elsewhere in the same conflict. And these were people in the Polish case in whose name we were fighting, mm -hmm. uh, whether nominally or not. You know, they were, this was the country for which we went to war. Uh, and, and I think Poland, particularly for that reason, deserves to you know, have a place in the British narrative mm -hmm. uh, and by extension in the American narrative. And, and that's something that hopefully this book can, can begin to achieve. Just a sort of a question to um, ask something a bit controversial, maybe. But uh, what, what would you say to someone who might say, oh, you know, Poland had all those concentration camps. I'm not going to cry over what happened to the to Poland in the war. Um, yeah. How would you approach that sort of statement or question? Um, well, it's I mean, it's coming from a place of ignorance. Um, I think I, the first the first approach would be to try and educate someone with that opinion. Of course, the concentration camps you talk about Auschwitz and so on. You know, these are it's crucial people understand this. These are German concentration camps erected by the Germans on Polish soil mm -hmm. and primarily uh, inhabited by Poles. So Auschwitz, for example, is set up in its first instance in 1940 as a concentration camp for Poles. This mm -hmm. isn't run by Poles. Mm -hmm. This isn't governed by Poles. It's governed by Germans, run by Germans. And the, the first inhabitants of that camp are Poles. So, you know, people have to understand that, you know, this this is where the, the, the current Polish government gets very hot under the collar, where it sort of objects to this phrase Polish concentration camps, mm -hmm. because, you know, those those camps. Yes, certainly then now they are in Poland, but that doesn't make them Polish. They are German concentration camps on Polish soil. Uh, so I, I kind of I sympathize, actually, with that with that uh, rather sort of. Uh, sensitive response that that, that uh, modern polls have to that because it, it's it it reflects sort of a, not just historical laziness but historical illiteracy mm -hmm. to suggest that the polls are actually setting up these camps and running them is an absolute nonsense. Mm 
they are the primary victims of those camps. Mm -hmm. And half half of the of the uh, the the death toll from the Holocaust as well are Polish Jews. Mm -hmm. So you know we have to we have to get away from this sort of whether it's by accident or des design. You know, uh, suggesting in any way that the Poles are responsible for those camps because they're absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you did mention a few times what you hope, you know, the book will fill this historical gap. Do you want to elaborate yeah. on what you hope uh, the book will do for readers? Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's, um, you know, there's a big story there to tell. I, I don't have, I, you know, I, I have a lot of uh, historian friends, writer friends. You know, we we sort of discuss about these things, friends and colleagues. And, you know, some some of them write about, you know, the more well-trodden paths of history. And that's fine. You know, we all have to we all have to earn our crust and the rest of it. My interest is always in trying to do something a bit different. I don't want to tell a story that's been told, you know, 10 times already. Mm -hmm. I would rather tell something that is that is much newer, that is fresher and actually, you know, breaking new ground. Um, and I hope that that would be, you know, recognized that people would take that on board. And, and uh, I think. I think this will be pretty new to a lot of uh, American readers. I mean, those certainly who are, you know, beyond the Polish diaspora uh, will probably be more or less uh, ignorant of these events. So, uh, you know, I'd hope to fill a gap for them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, to me, that's the that's the important task that history can can uh, fulfil. It's not just necessarily entertainment. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it should also have some sort of pedagogical purpose i you know sort of teaching us something that we don't already know and hopefully this book will do that as well mm -hmm. you actually uh what you just said um brought up a question um the atrocities committed by the uh, germans and maybe the soviets as well uh were they how much do you think was carried out by elite uh organizations within those militaries to do you know to eradicate enemies versus the common soldier being participate yeah participants yeah. in this that's a good question i mean in the, in the soviet case um there's not much in the way of initiative permitted to ordinary soldiers so uh where there are atrocities carried out they're most most likely to be carried out by the nkvd which is effectively you know the security services of the uh, of the red army mm -hmm. um so that's the soviet case but in the german case what's interesting is that in a lot of those examples that i do describe in the book um, it is not just SS forces that are carrying out these atrocities. So this, again, is in stark contrast to what you see in 1940. I made that comparison earlier on, Chris, if you remember, uh, looking at between 39 and 1940. Mm -hmm. In the French campaign where there are atrocities carried out, um, they're almost always carried out by the SS in 1940. Mm -hmm. But in 1939 in Poland... There are a couple of instances of the SS um, carrying out atrocities, particularly against Jews, it must be said. But in the vast majority of cases, it's ordinary Wehrmacht soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this is, um, to some extent, it's in the heat of the fight. It's, you know, you find yourself, you know, uh, behind the front lines. You take a pot shot at somebody and then, you know, the next minute the village is being torched and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And men are being rounded up and shot. So it's that, it's it's certainly heat of the moment, but... Also, I think with given that sort of political and ideological background that there is this narrative, you know, narrative strand within Nazism that views um, certainly the Poles and others as being racially inferior. Therefore, I think that that kicks on this aspect of, you know, you can do what with these people what you like, because there's no nobody is going to pull us up and tell us we can't do it. Mm -hmm. So there's a degree of, you know, the heat of the moment, the heat of back, the fog of war, all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. But it's backed by this sort of uh, racial ideology, I would suggest. But it's interesting, as I said, it's interesting in the Polish campaign, most of the atrocities carried out by Germans are carried out by ordinary Wehrmacht troops rather than SS, mm -hmm. which kind of bucks that, you know, there's this there's this um, narrative you often get of, you know, the idea of a clean Wehrmacht, that the Wehrmacht didn't commit atrocities, mm -hmm. which unfortunately is absolute nonsense, however much, uh, you know, some within Germany would want to believe it. Uh, it's absolute nonsense, and it's absolutely proven in 1939 to be nonsense. Um, it's still fa World War II is still fascinates me in in that there are so many lessons here or incidents and situations that still apply to modern warfare in in, in different ways. Yeah, um, yeah, like you said, you know the what you mentioned the invasion of Crimea, and and also thinking about the Middle East yeah. and reprisal killings and. 
and racial and religious superiority or differences, you know, among. Yeah. I mean, all of that, groups. all of that is, you know, uh, kicks in, in this, in this example. I mean, it's, it, it, it's, there is a lot there actually. It's quite, it's quite telling. And, and when I, when you see these parallels, you know, certainly in terms of um, the parallels between Soviet behavior in 39 and then Russian behavior, you know, most recently in Ukraine, for example, um, you know, it's, it's quite striking that the, the, it, 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 there, there's very striking parallels between the two, which are, you know, very surprising. But I suppose nothing much changes. As uh, as uh, Shakespeare said, there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Can you, uh, did you have any difficulties getting the book uh, finished or published? No, no, absolutely not. I, I was a little bit up, up against it time-wise. I had originally planned to publish uh, both. I had contracts UK and US, and I planned to publish both uh, for the anniversary of the, of the events, with the 80th anniversary, which was last September. Um, I did deliver a little bit late. Unfortunately, I lost my mother last year, which kind yeah. of, um, you know, set things off off the rails a little bit for a while. But I managed to deliver, I think, January of last year, um, and that meant that the UK UK edition came out uh, for the anniversary, which was good. Unfortunately, the US uh, kind of missed their, their sort of publication run, so that was a bit delayed. Mm. But no, actually, the writing phase actually went very smoothly. It was, it was, it was uh, you know, a, a real pleasure to write. I had some really good material. As I said, I really enjoyed the writing phase. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that was a really positive experience, uh, and the publishers were you know tremendously supportive, editors and so on, all tremendously supportive. So now that's actually you know apart from a you know an emotional uh, roller coaster with uh, with with losing my mum last year, but yeah. you know apart from that, it was uh, it all went very smoothly. Yeah. Okay. What's your next writing project, or or maybe you've started it already? Uh, the next project is actually on quite an interesting sort of sub narrative i suppose of the holocaust which is of um this sort of systematic uh, forging of latin american passports by uh, again by polish diplomats in switzerland which was carried out over you know two year period between 41 and 43 hmm. um which is very much a sort of coming story it's been it's, it's sort of emerging slowly at the moment it's it hasn't been known for a long time um so i'm i'm uh, researching that at the moment and that i hope to to start writing uh, you know very very soon mm-hmm. but it's a fascinating story so watch that space okay um where can people find you on the net do you have a website social media that sort of thing i do have a website which is uh www.rogermorehouse.com mm-hmm. uh and i am on twitter at uh, at Roger underscore Morehouse. I'm sure you'll be able to find me on there. Okay. Uh, very nice black and white picture of my face as an avatar. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm certainly on uh, a website and on Twitter, yes. And just to spell that for listeners, that's uh, Roger is R-O-G-E-R, and Morehouse yeah. is M-O-O-R-H-O-U-S-E. Perfect. So that's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? Wonderful. No, I... Look forward to seeing the uh, the US edition. I always always very keen, happy to be published uh, stateside. So I'm very excited about that. I hope to be uh, coming over to the states in May, but obviously the coronavirus might uh, intervene and and mm. scupper those plans. But I hope to be over there to to do some uh, promotion for the book mm. uh, on the East Coast, Washington and New York. So we'll see if that can still happen. I hope so. Uh, but either way, whether I'm there or not, I hope the book does well, and I hope it's I hope the readers enjoy it. And thanks, thanks for your time today. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening. If you like this podcast, Military History Inside Out, please subscribe to it and rate it and review it if possible. I have many other options as well to get great military history information. You can find links to interesting military history videos on my Facebook page, War Scholar. You can find links to interesting military history news articles, military history archaeology information, and academic information on my Twitter page, War Scholar. You can find photos on my Instagram page, Chris Alvarez War Scholar. You can find my military history videos on my YouTube page, War Scholar 1945. You can also sign up for my newsletter at warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com. In the newsletter, I post additional video and news links, as well as regular updates on new military history books being published. Thank you for listening.